Eh, benvenute. Good Io evening, so everybody. My name is Antonella Sciarra. I am a social as art socialist social artist and uh, journalist. I also would like to thank EGV, the National Geophysical and Volcanology Institute, and, and so Eric, and also Madame Nadia Lobue for having the idea of creating this hybrid forum between art and science, which allow us to understand those topics that are crucial. These are cross-cutting and important topics, for sure. The panel of today is public art in the natural environment, from environmental research to contemporary art. It is a meeting to explore ecology, sustainability, social uh, environment and art through the contribution of artists that are the more um, representatives of this period. We will also elaborate this message in an information perspective within scientific communication. We will discuss uh, with the, uh, the panelists that are here with me. I'm very glad to have them here because they are great professionals. In particular, we have uh, Ilaria Biento, artist. Then we have uh, Chiara Anaclio, art director and artist. Roberto Ghezzi with us. Uh, He's joining remotely, Carlo Alberto Mattaroli, a terrorist and teacher of uh, museum didact didactics, and Ilaria Lucrezia Rossi, physicist and uh, scientific uh, trainer. We have the first slide. Let's start. The reason why we are here is that the message around environment and the protection of all the ecosystem and oceans is a cross-cutting message that concerns all of us. So art during the last 50 to 60 years is giving us the chance to benefit of the, this materials in several ways. The first point is that artists since ever are the mirror of our society because despite the challenges and what happens, art, artists and female artists as well are in a position of reflection and they allow us with contemporary art to think together on the latest event, e events, to elaborate them and to denounce them. In particular, we can, for example, talk about topics such as the contemporary theories of Bourdieu, an art critic, director of Centre Pompidou in Paris, in relation to the, the conditions that allow us to understand the theoretical approach, leading us to consequences also from uh, relation, art, social art, and this kind of expression. The latest 60 years have led to the fall and the decadence of any kind of idea of centrism and the fall of the paradigm of center and peripheral. When we discuss about those two worlds and spheres, we do not refer to a geographical space, even though this is a consequence. Any form of centrism, if we think about phallocentrism or ethnocentrism, we are tackling a vertical condition in which there is some sort of hierarchy where there is a center, a core, and a prevalence, a dominance of something getting to contemporary uh, age in the latest 100 century, uh, 100 years, uh, Anthropocene, for example, well, there is an aware awareness of what is the impact of human activity on the environment. This kind of centrism almost abolishes, abolishes anthropocentrism because the human being is no longer the center of the planet, the sole reference point. So this new awareness has led to the interruption of what is called the monoocular perspective, 
which is a fictitious division between culture and nature. It is a matter that it is horizontal compared to the vertical perspective. So we do recognize that there is an inclusivity of all kinds of diversity, putting the human being within in a different position compared to all the other beings, living beings in the world. Borio actually goes beyond this idea and it also includes objects and technology, but this is another field um, that we will not tackle today. In this direction, so in this horizontal line that can be considered a neopantheism, secular neopantheism, there is an important theme uh, from Strauss concerning regarding the catastrophe. If the human being does not realize how to limit the power of their, its own actions, we will face catastrophes and disasters in which consequences are comparable to uh, very difficult, different scenarios. For example, Holocaust can be uh, completely uh, compared to climate change and natural disaster because it is the result of the same kind of process. In this kind of uh, separation, which is a going beyond the level in which we are, where we perceive the need to have this kind of inclusivity, well, at this point, the ecosystem is considered in a secular neopantheism where all of us, we are interconnected, we see in this kind of connection also the same systems and the same identities that are no longer related to continents but to archipelagos, which is a little bit what anti-spacism considers, because we eat, a, we do not eat a dog, but we eat a fish, and this is a cultural structure. Without further ado, now I leave the floor with the panelists. Um, and first I will give you some real examples of artists and contemporary artists, and we will see in which way those artists dealt with those topics, and then, I will leave the floor to the panelists of today. The first element is a technical component. The artistic evolution goes together hand in hand with a technical evolution. And we have here new possibilities. In this case, we are talking about a technical evolution, a technology that is used with paints that are uh, sustainable called air light. These are used externally and they allow the reduction of environmental impact and fingerprint by humans. This is a piece of art located in a very polluted area in Rome on a building. So Jana Krutz has created this muralis called anti-pollution and with these paints, with uh, these uh, eco-sustainable uh, paints, he is able to reduce pollution and he represented this heron that is an endangered species. In the same line, we find this French artist who has invented a biological organic paint, an eco-sustainable paint. In particular, this Arctic artist is a pioneer in film painting. He works with a perspective that is particularly visible only from above with a satellite with very, very long distances. And this is one of the widest piece of art that were created in the world and it is located in the Alps and it is very very wide and extensive. These are other kinds of artworks. Here you can see the natural environment is is filled of action. Also not only on on fields but on the beach or in, in mountains among mountains. Another important uh, artist is Bordalo the second a Portuguese artist who creates thresh, thresh animals. These are three-dimensional sculptures created with objects that are recycled and reused, bicycle, sofas, any kind of 
uh, object that is uh, to is destined to be waste and this is also a, provo uh, a way of provoking the society that is consumist society with trash i can create a piece of art so uh, he says that uh, uh, why we are not able to recycle those items if I am able to create a piece of art, a piece of art from them. Here you see other examples with a whale that was installed in, in water. We have an example also in Rome near to San Pietro's station. Here we have a Spanish ar uh, artist with uh, his miniatures, Isaac Cordal. These miniatures are, den he denounces pollution and the non-respect of ecosystems and climate crisis. But the most interesting part is that here human beings are represented uh, in gray compared to um, the alienation of the contemporary human being. But since they are miniatures, they are placed in areas that are not, are not visible in cities. And the curator has happily called the places of the peripheral view everything that is not explicit, visit, visible, or directly directed to our gaze is present in, uh, in, um, in other areas of the city, and they also deliver a very important message. Very often, uh, we have, for example, decision makers who discuss about uh, those challenges while the world continues to be polluted. Yes, uh, on the lower uh, part of the uh, screen, you see Donald Trump and the title of the artwork is uh, uh, Game of Thrones. In those examples here, he denounces the most critical challenges of uh, our age, uh, nuclear uh, energy and the pandemic. Andreco is um, a Roman artist. He is an environmental engineer. He works with the cross-cutting uh, teams so there is a mix between the scientific artistic and activism uh, here he created a project started in france in 2015 called climate art project and it is developed in several areas of the world with the participation of citizens who are include who are involved in those arts work of art and the site specific element is that here some environmental problems are showed for example in india there is pollution in venice the sea level rising and this is the project flumen made in lazio region where there is a study and a sampling uh, project of uh, sea of uh, river waters and uh, very often they end with a march of sensibilization with all citizens. Anaïs Tonner is a great artist. She deals with the, the same topics and she defines herself as um, well, the definition that she uses is very interesting. She is a visual artist living in Paris, and together with geologists, ocean uh, experts of oceans, philosophy, and anthropologists, she carries out exhibition. Um, expeditions in even Chernobyl. She created a collection of herbs in Chernobyl, for example, and with her artistic research, she looks for uh, a renewal of our perspective and she explores what is new to interrupt Anthropocene. In this case, she dealt with a particular phenomenon, the uh, tourmaline circulation, and we will have our Ilaria Rossi describing this, uh, um, this field. So I will go quicker on this. But basically, she talks about tourmaline circulation, as you see here, which is the, the movement of oceans compared to what is the big ribbon that you see on the lower part of the screen on the right, a way of circulating of waters that is moved by a density variation depending on the 
um, temperature and salinity of water. This kind of uh, movement tells us a lot of things on oceans and their system, but also on the fact that oceans with uh, 150 uh, years, uh, 1,050, 100 years, uh, it, the ocean is able to change and the ocean has its own time and the, all waters are different one from the other. So the artist decided to sample 33 uh, little containers of ocean water collected all along the uh, ribbon, the conveyor uh, from the surface just down on, under the sea water at 8,000 uh, meters in depth. This was possible thanks to the air expert oceanographists coming from all over the world. And uh, also thanks to the support of Ari Bryden. Here we have breath, the, uh, the widest work from Land Artert made in Italy. It is 120,000 square meters here in Italy. And this work was done because uh, Monte Olivella, Olivella Mount was, uh, was basically destroyed uh, in the past years and this caused several issues. For example, we also saw several problems such as landslides. So the artist decided to reforest this area with the trees whose perimeter follows the form of a battery. The message is quite clear that our mobile uh, runs out of battery and together our planet is finishing its own resources. Then if the trees are planted, then we will see the battery that is in charge this artwork was created with environmental engineers. They used some kind of um, trees, such as maple trees, where and their leaves change during the year with, from red to green. And so it follows exactly the same colors of the battery. The last example that I bring to you well, this is a very interesting example. It is a uh, subaquatic museum. This is an artwork from Jesa de Cartelo, and the most famous one is, is located in Mexico with 500 statues um, and, and in real dimensions, and the characteristics are different. For example, he puts uh, underwater some um, real life uh, situation. And in other cases, he puts some sensibilization situation. They change a lot. For example, in Lanzarote, there was a huge focus on migration. So a very deep reflection on the death of migrants at sea in the Mediterranean. And here we can see, for example, a great, uh, huge emotional impact in this on the seabed. In China, we have examples in Australia for the protection of Coral Bay. The most interesting example is that materials are eco-compatible and all the sculptures are created by the com with the combination of rocks and subaquatic uh, materials that have a neutral pH. So they are used in a way to foster, to support conservation and the reproduction of species, in particular, the endangered species. Just before closing and leaving the floor to Madame Rossi, I just tell you, I would like to, th to say this. What can we uh, understand from this reflection? Well, first of all, the difference between empathic and rational aspects is not real, uh, such as the division between art and science. These aspects are contaminated the one with the other, and they are they evolve by 
having a conversation between them. So uh, this is why I would like to finish with a sentence from the artist Brack saying that I like rules that correct emotions. I like the emotions that correct the rules. Thank you. After all this long speech, we continue with the other speakers, with Ilaria Lucrezia Rossi. She studies physics and she is a physicist at La Sapienza. She uses uh, the page, she science, and she is a communicator. She worked at CERN and she studied for one year in the Sorbonne in Paris. She won the Back to Zero Award at Sapienza University, and she works in STEM disciplines, science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. And she really hopes to be able to explain in the future a new part of the universe. Ilaria, you have the floor. I have a few slides to present to you. Well, first of all, for me, it's, it is a great pleasure to be here. I'm Ilaria, and I'm a physicist at Sapienza. I love neurosciences. I love art as well. And I let me reassure that I am a Tuscan lady. And in my life, I create TikToks video. About one year ago, I opened my page, See She Science, where I start telling my passion for science. And the page now has 20,000 followers, around 1 million likes, and several million views. And this project makes me really, really proud. I try to tell what I like the most about science, my daily life, and my work, but I also would like to tell through my page which are the most negative aspects of this uh, path. My relationship with the, the feeling of failure, anxiety, the fact of not understanding science and physics, despite my field of expertise. In our mind, the uh, role of the scientist um, is someone, uh, is a genius, a white man around 60 years of age, year age and for many of us, it is very hard to put ourselves in those shoes because we feel uncomfortable. We are in an environment that is oriented to performance and everyone feels valuable. But for most of the people working in this field, it is very hard to carry on with the study on scientific in the scientific field. This is why I fight a lot on gender issues and they cherish those topics. And I try to do this with videos that are interesting to youngsters. And I try to, to make it quite popular. I try to change the narrative of women in science. And I also discuss how the press uh, tackles the role of uh, female scientists. I really care about the, the, the spreading of a science that is accessible by everybody. And this is a very important process because we know that it is possible to create a virtuous circle between represent, representation and change. If we see very often a different image of making science, it would be possible for a girl to say that she could start a career in this. I can study physics and mathematics and so on. So maybe someone else will some will fall in love with science and will study the universe, for example. I think that this change has to go together with an aesthetic change because if I look for uh, the world physicist that is genderless in English, these are the main images that come out that for example, this is uh, quite a similar image. You see a male 
and this is what I want to do, to change the image that you see of the scientist, someone who never smiles, a very serious person, not necessarily a genius. In this way, we can create passion within people. I think that the role of art in this is crucial. I fell in love with physics by looking at the images of the space and with the biography of Marie Curie, where on the front page there was an image of her in the laboratory and she was completely at ease in that environment. In particular, I think that uh, the communication has to focus on an empathic science because we cannot limit ourselves to make, to spread information we also have to play on the social role of science and the emotional touch that of the world's words that we choose so that we can really have and see a great change. This is the main strengths that I have, messages that I receive, such as those one that I publish on my social media. And this reminds me how concrete is and tangible is the impact of science on the life of people. Thank you very much for your attention. Now we will switch to the second part of my presentation where I will talk to you about oceans and the theme of this event, which is ocean circulation and the importance of this phenomenon on climate change. We know that the ocean is made of water, that there are currents and streams, but as we have anticipated, water can have different features and currents can have causes and differences that are very complex to understand. In the words of the geophysics physicist, uh, Carl Wunsch, theories without observations are irrelevant and observations without theories are not interp interpretable and not understandable. This is because our understanding of this phenomenon is partial due to the lack of information that we had up until now. In particular, for many years, we had an, a partial view and modern oceanography starts at the end of 1800 with expeditions lasting for 10 years, maybe, with useless attempt to assess currents or other features. So most of these exhibition, ex, expeditions were a failure. We had an image of the ocean, such as an homogeneous mass of water, where currents and streams were very variable with macro changes over hundreds of years, while the uh, deep water was completely neglected. This is a very wrong picture, and we know this today, but thanks to the chance and some uh, friendly um, ducks, we saw a very interesting event. These are the floating ducks that were put in the Pacific Ocean during a storm. A cargo ship actually loses the what it was transporting, so these uh, little objects were released into the ocean. This was very useful to oceanographists to understand the circulation of waters on the surface. In fact, in fact, you can see here, I don't know if why it is upside down, but you see here the ducks started traveling all around the world and were found in several areas. By observing the places where the docks were found with a computer called Obscur, two oceanographists were able to follow the main routes of ocean uh, currents with a lot of data that before were unknown. Well, it is amazing what a duck can teach you, as said the oceanographist. Today, we have wonderful images coming from the satellites showing the change in currents and streams. And it is very interesting for uh, the surface currents. Nevertheless, we still have a partial understanding. 
we used to divide the circulation in uh, surface circulation and deep circulation, depending on the density variation of the water column. This idea is based on a stratification of the ocean in several areas compared to the density and the features of the water. We know that colder water is more dense, so it goes down, and salinity also affects density because salt has its own weight, so it brings down the water. So we create several areas and several layers. In particular, I would like to, to talk to you about thermoaline circulation. It is linked to temperature, thermal and aline salinity. It is a mix of current involving all the, la the, the planet due to changes in density and a mix of different temperatures and salinity. When we have a change in those two parameters, water moves uh, because of, uh, in a certain way, because of these different parameters. Temperature has a higher impact on density compared to salinity. So uh, very hot water, very salty water is able to float over wa uh, colder water. So this mechanism is called tapirulan or conveyor belt of water. Uh, with the melting of ice in some areas of the planet, there are very dense amounts of water that are released. These start moving towards warmer areas and less dense areas, and they create a, vis a virtuous circle, and the cir the, this circle continues so on. This has a huge impact on global climate. Actually, oceans cover 70% of global surface of land of the planet. It uh, collects 97% of water in the planet and it stock and it also store uh, 50%. They store 50% of uh, carbon dioxide in the uh, planet. We also know today, thanks to the research, that global warming causes a fall of Atlantic circulation. Since global, um, the superficial waters warming blocks the circulation of deeper waters. And we also know that carbon dioxide is harder to be solved in warmer waters. So there is a higher presence of carbon dioxide, uh, greenhouse gas, and there is and there are less uh, resources for marine organisms. The reduction of current has also an impact on the transport of chemicals that regulate the balance in ecosystems. And the transport of warmth is also impacted here. Now, the, the topic here remains open because we do not have a global idea and detailed idea of the mechanisms regulating the temperature and the climate and there are several phenomena in place here what we know is that we can have an impact as human beings with our choices because it is very important to spread uh, awareness around the topic and to spread information and so scientific progress will be fundamental in the following years. Thank you for your attention and now I'll leave the floor to Antonella once again. Thank you. Thank you, Ilaria. Now we continue with Roberto Ghezzi. He is joining us remotely, as you see. Hello, Roberto, and welcome. Well, he, Roberto Ghezzi is an artist, a visual artist, who displays personal and collective shows all around the world, from Venice to North Macedonia, Copenhagen, Argen, uh, Argentina, Africa, China, and many other places. His production is focused on natural environment through pictorial representation and on-site research. Their creations are incredible. 
with the exper experimentation on very remote areas. And he also shows the idea of the final results and the process before. The process is part of the artwork at the origin of the relationship between artists and nature, and the support is the union between those worlds. His research started in the 90s with a scientific approach and organic study, and then he concretized all of this through the matter. Roberto has worked in a project called Greenland Project. There is no need to add other information. I directly leave the floor to him. Thank you, Antonella. I hope you will hear me well, because my, connect, my network is not that strong. Well, thank you very much for the invitation. I'm very comfortable and happy to talk about my research after what was said. Well, I thought you were saying that you feel comfortable talking to us by your car. Well, I would have preferred being somewhere else, but I had some technical, some, some logistic issues. So we had to stop in a place to have this meeting with you. I'm Roberto Ghezzi. I'm a visual artist. And ha as you have anticipated, uh, for some years, I have left the world of classic representation. I'm a painter. I have studied paint, paint uh, techniques, and I used to be that kind of artist with several techniques. Well, naturography and writing nature. This is an artwork uh, that uh, sees the artist as an architect, as an engineer, posing the base, the pillars for the artwork to be real. I will show you later some images. The artist chooses a place and a pattern, a fabric, and then on the basis of the conditions, thanks to the researchers that are with him, we carry out the installation of very weird installations. And it is not land art. It is only part of the process itself of the creation. And these artworks stay there in place for years, months, in contact with the environment. And they take the magic, magic and the spirit, the soul of those places. The environment can be land, sea, or air. And then these artworks are able to have an aesthetic in nature that follows the function. This aesthetic is completely different to what we were used to see as artists. And in this, uh, we see a great fascination and a great amazement. This beauty is incredible and it has hidden in it a very deep rationality and a deep mystery. Well, I would like to show you the images, actually. Some of my artworks, it will be easier than to understand what I'm talking about. because I will, I will need the support of my images. Well, I need to share my screen, I guess. Here you see a series of installations. This is what, what I was saying. So the preparation of naturography, this term meaning, uh, well, I created this term, this world to identify this form of art between painting and photography. It is the writing of nature. Here you see the installation in the phase of, on, in the making. These are different compared to seasons and I choose different fabrics. Naturale, lino, organza, seta, dipende dal, dallo studio preliminare che viene fatto. But this Im image is sim an example. Here I'm in a lake and it seems like fishing nets. And nothing is here by chance. I let 
the nature and the environment to do its own work. This is the main idea of naturography. So the artist that steps aside and allows nature and the environment to be the protagonist here to the public, to the viewer or people visiting the exhibition or will listen to uh, the description of the artwork. This project studies very de in detail where to put the installation compared to the depth of waters and the other features, the kind of characteristics of the environment and everything related to uh, the authorizations and the assessment. These are some examples of artworks. This was created in a lake in the central part of Italy. You see that the artwork has an horizontal line. I always leave half uh, of the artwork in the water and the other part in outside, in the outside, because they become, once retrieved, some kind of landscapes, abstract landscapes, but there is nothing more realistic than that. These projects were placed, uh, for example, in South Africa. And this here there is an integration with the low tide and uh, sand. This is me installing compared to the place. Well, uh, they ask uh, several, well, I need several tools and different tools, for example, so I often collaborate with a number of environmentalist uh, associations and uh, therefore everything is absolutely environmentally friendly and uh, also they remain inside the water for a limited period of time but they have a uh, a temporary let's say phase also extended because it may also last for a few years but the um there are traces uh, that are left on the fabric day after day. And uh, then this is uh, something I actually installed a few uh, weeks ago at the Urchala Ionica port. And uh, very often there are places in which I create installations. Well, I started in uh, wild places actually, but in the last few year, years also in anthropized areas. But I am carrying out a sort of research that creates a contact between uh, nature and uh, the natural activity and also uh, the fabric. But the, this uh, actually is what happens uh, in uh, several Italian cities, as Venice, for instance. So these are the works once taken back, and you see that there's the same type of fabric in different places, can provide uh, different shapes and colors. So these are uh, the two uh, uh, different sides where animals, for instance, uh, uh, with, uh, uh, for instance, uh, animals and uh, also uh, the slugs have uh, actually eaten uh, some portions and uh, then also besides the colors that can be interested and in the shapes that look abstract, what I'm interested in is the uh, search for uh, an absolutely natural aesthetic that comes from an animal that is looking for food or also uh, by, uh, for instance, um, uh, specific types of weeds uh, that are, um, for instance, uh, uh, about to uh, follow their own pathway. So I'm not just taking a, a fabric and leave it there randomly and they take it back randomly because everything is studied in advance. But I plan nothing of the final result. Um, be, for instance, I uh, only consider that there are shapes or, or uh, colors which are completely natural, but everything was stimulated uh, on the basis of my initial, let's say, uh, uh, preparation with the choice of what to, uh, of the depth at which putting the work and also the season in which putting the fabric. Then, yeah, just a second, but 
when is it that you understand that the moment comes to remove it? I mean, in the evolution of uh, your works, when do you understand that the time has come to remove them? Well, uh, this is a, um, a, a good question. Actually, to me, and according to me, nature interacts with my fabric and with all of the uh, uh, objects, but if nature is on another nature, you don't see the difference. Because of course, if in a wood you see, for instance, uh, uh, we uh, leaves on the ground, on the floor, well, uh, that is something which is normal. Whereas my works, well, if you, for instance, have uh, a leaf uh, or a pine needle that is on the floor, on the ground, then uh, in this case, it leaves a trace. So uh, it is visible that this is a work in which there was a dialogue between my fabric and the environment, but it's not a piece of landscape. And at the end of the day, all of these fabrics, since they are 100% natural, uh, of course, um, they are told and uh, uh, in some cases, they go through a sort of uh, decomposition phase. And I love the reaction between the fabric and uh, uh, also the interaction stemming from the environment. And as you see, uh, the underlying part of fabrics uh, uh, was completely tore. And uh, uh, you see that in one of the two fabrics, uh, there are holes, whereas in other, in the other tissue, in the other fabric, uh, you see that the, the, the action was different. And uh, this was um, something that was done at the Venice Lagoon. And uh, these act with colors and shapes because of course, the, um, it becomes a sort of sculpture. So, then um, these ideas started, but then they were compared to other situations in, in several areas of the world, like Patagonia or uh, the, uh, well, Tunisia, the Lofoten Islands, uh, always accompanied by projects and artists, of course. And also, uh, for instance, as you said before, this is a uh, last July uh, project in uh, the uh, Greenland, at the uh, Greenland, and um, the ice is not leaving colors, although it can have colors due to the refraction, but the ice uh, by melting, well, water is not releasing any colors. So in this case, I've used uh, some liquids uh, and it's an, an old, uh, let's say photographic technique. And then, um, for instance, I uh, included these um, materials uh, below the ice. And uh, for instance, in this particular case, well, uh, they were studied just because I read, and this is part of the art and science approach that we use, an article by Biagio Di Maro uh, from the Polar uh, Art and Science. And he made a study on red weeds and um, uh, there are weeds that invade some of the areas of the glaciers of the Greenland, Greenland and uh, they grow in places where ice melts. And they are not directly, for instance, due to the work of uh, human beings, but indirectly they worsen the effects because due to the uh, fact that they are red, they are less reflecting the white eyes. So what did I do then? I wanted to uh, uh, organize these activities and do these works. And there were papers and they were just below the white eyes and uh, also below the uh, red eyes. And I got some interesting results. So here, this is when they are interacting and uh, I call them naturographies. Um, and the, it's the eyes that creates the work by melting, um, as a, a science of the CNR would say. So uh, these are the drops released. Um, so this is a work that was actually um, created under white eyes. And this is a work which is at the same time, so let's say 15 centimeters, same time of the day, and invaded by red weeds. 
So you see there are areas in which the red weed, well, since uh, the ice melt and melted, uh, it was attached to the paper. So it is a naturography um, and they chose the writing of nature. And um, and uh, also, since uh, well, I'm referring to the things that you've said already, you see here that I'm particularly convinced about the fact that art cannot, uh, for instance, give solutions and uh, it can allow you to change your point of view. So a different point of view also submitted to a scientist. You know um, that if we sometimes have different uh, backgrounds that there must be um, an encounter in between. But submitting a work like this one, what well, was very interesting on my side, because this is something that, uh, for instance, uh, never happens uh, at the ice stations. Um, so it is a new way for them as well to operate. So. Uh, uh, it, this is art that takes uh, instruments from the science and science that uh, science can take, uh, um, for instance, uh, uh, the results of the art. And then there's a third level that is to say the dissemination. So I am truly in favor of uh, dissemination. And in my opinion, art in this case becomes a sort of a fundamental uh, master because if you show an image of uh, an, uh, um, well, there are many images now, but if you show a difference between, uh, for instance, uh, the uh, glacier uh, in 1919 and in 1995 uh, or 2020, well, of course, or images, when you see images every day, then you get used to them. And images don't surprise you any longer. Images at a certain point, uh, if you see them always, they don't um, trigger any emotion in you. And uh, uh, of course, this is important also for those that can see this art and admire it and uh, have it passing through the heart and through the mind due to and for our daily activities. Well, thank you. Thank you, Roberto. Thank you so much for your extraordinary contribution. Well, it's been a pleasure for me. Thank you. Okay, thank you. So let's continue now with our marathon. And um, uh, we have now uh, Chiara Natleo, and um, uh, she has a, a cross-sectional activity that integrates painting, words, digital arts, sound, and images. So Chiara Anaclio. And uh, this is close to narration, and uh, the artistic research is permeated by the sense and use of colors as a means of expression, and also on uh, the uh, effects on the arts. And she carried out and performed a lot of arts, both in Italy and abroad. And uh, she won several awards, including the Biennale of Rome. And she was a finalist at the Rotonda Award in Livorno. And she participated in a lot of exhibitions and uh, museum and uh, museum places. And also as a uh, mm, painting at the International House of Women uh, in Rome. So Chiara will share with us what is the matrix of her artistic research. You have the floor. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes, we do. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. Good afternoon. I would like to start my contribution by quote with a quote. I don't know how the world will judge me, but it seems to me that I'm just a kid, a child, uh, playing at the seaside and I had some fun in finding a pebble or a shell that was more beautiful than ever when the ocean of the truth was in front of me and no one was looking for it. So this is by one of the uh, main physicians and uh, um, 
According to Isaac Newton's words, because this is what uh, who said it, I find a deep link between artistic research and scientific research. That is to say, to continue to uh, to push a vision, although the truth, um, uh, well, the um, the ocean of the truth is in front of us, and Newton in this sentence also evokes an image and a process which are absolutely important, that is to say, creativity. So usually in the common meaning, we think it's like, oh yeah, you had a sort of uh, uh, moment of art or a, a, a sudden inspiration or something that crystallizes. Whereas the creative process is uh, an ongoing process, uh, as, um, a work in progress, and uh, it comes from uh, uh, prospects and important uh, questions, and also sometimes from feelings, or also uh, from a fundamental question that you say, "Why do I want to say? What do I have to say? What do I have? What I want to share with the others?" So everything uh, includes different phases. So the creative process includes different phases. That's the phase of incubation, a phase of collection of data, and a phase which is super interesting. That is uh, the inner face, uh, that is to say, the encounter with the vacuum. And it's quite scary, uh, actually, but when you are walking along the beach, you fear that the uh, there's nothing after it and the beach ends. So in that moment, when you are able to face this uh, darkness of uh, limbo, then this is where... Uh, while you keep on walking, you continue to see the shell that is more beautiful than the other ones. And Daniel Goleman, who is a famous psychologist of our contemporary times, in his book, The Creative Spirit, uh, analyzes this process through psychology. And uh, he says that this can... Uh, well, that creativity is a journey that starts with the bravery of exploring the depths of your mind and transform imagination into reality. It requires to be open-minded and the willingness to uh, challenge conventions. Through creation, we can break the barriers of our limits and enchant the world. If we compare artistic research to a journey where we are analyzing the unexplored ocean, then uh, through the observation of phenomena, we may have and create new conditions, but also a vision of the future. And it's important nowadays, more than ever. I love the link between art and science. And it seems to me that besides a methodology linked to the processes, It also, well, they both target to the same activities. I would like to ask you to close your eyes for 10 seconds and to evoke an image or two images. I'll count to 10 and you tell me what is the deep blue? So three, two, one, go. Uno, due, tre, quattro, cinque, sei, blu profondo, sette, otto, nove, respiriamo. Ah, bravi. <laughs> okay, that's done. Very good. Thank you. So I would like to ask each one of you, but we can't. I'd like to ask you, what did you see? If you've seen anything, of course.
Ci pensi? Beh, sì. Accanto? Laura, che blu hai visto? Laura, which blue did you see? Which blue did you see? Okay, thank you. Uh, well, of course, I thought about Sardinia and also uh, the blue of a painting. Of a painting? But a painting in particular? No, no, a, a painting which I actually painted. Uh, all right. Unfortunately, we cannot hear the voice of the person keep speaking without the microphone. Bellissimo, bellissimo. Allora, io faccio questo eh, gioco. Okay, I actually uh, asked you to make this uh, activity because very often when I start a project, I always leave some images to come from the inside and I trust these images because these directions often have a name, they are often words, and words have an etymology. So very often it leads to uh, even deeper meanings. For instance, Chetwin, which, who is an anthropologist in uh, one of his works, talk about, talks about the Australian uh, people that when, when they wanted to describe territories, they were singing about them. So they were developing a sort of a core of identity. And this is just why all of, um, I mean, all of this preamble on the deep blue is just because I closed my eyes for this artistic project. And uh, I saw things, as you told me, and in particular, I, uh, for instance, uh, saw the abbeys, or I saw, for instance, uh, uh, the uh, uh, fireflies, or the deep love that links me to the nature. And uh, this is not just to say, I mean, it's a link that becomes a feeling, a bond that becomes a feeling. And within this feeling, you respect, as it happens with, with love, you respect the other. And it, when it comes uh, to the creative process, then there's a construction phase. And... Uh, you were thinking of an image, which is not. It's Amore Dodici. It is a, a, um, something divided by 12. So it is a, a sort of score. And uh, each moment is uh, represented by a poem. It is therefore a narrative system. Only after you have uh, these works that represent all of these hours. So as you may see, my expression uh, is abstract in this case. So even more when I talk about love or the feelings I have for nature, then uh, these feelings uh, uh, don't have to be filtered. I don't want my feelings to be filtered. So this uh, uh, night, uh, if, for instance, uh, here, I see, for instance, fireflies, or I see how touched and moved I am by flowers, or, for instance, uh, uh, Walt Whitman, uh, for instance, uh, and uh, uh, the Joan. So it's a love story that lasts for 12 hours. Okay, so I would like to uh, linger on uh, this. Uh, 
which is a sparkle on off, and this is the name, and uh, it is a diptych. And uh, each one of us as artists uh, determines and um, uh, as to the feelings that we have, well, I believe that um, this evasion, this idea of not taking on responsibility for what we feel, well, this contributes, I think, to this distance between things and also the responsibility for change. So to me, art is to convey a meaning and to nod, although I don't understand, I feel it. Well, that is general idea. And in this diptych that was uh, created to represent, for instance, um, uh, this uh, uh, specific uh, fireflies during the night, I remember there were people coming to me, especially the one on the left hand side, and they used to ask me, but is this a galaxy? Or is this an abyss? Or there were people were asking me, are these souls that are about to be born again? And I've never answered nah, anything like, oh no, you're wrong. Because basically, the system that Newton refers to, that is say a system of uh, uh, surprise. And it's like saying it's an amazement or an astonishment, a wonder. And then you have to uh, have a new horizon where you don't see any longer what's yours and what's mine, but it becomes an important resource. So Jung was talking about universal archetypes. And uh, it's uh, like saying, okay, each one of us has these universal archetypes and a new storytelling uh, is a storytelling that thinks about the future. So, another quotation, for instance, is the following. That is to say, the idea of feeling, but there's a Maurice Merleau-Ponty, who's a philosopher, that says in art, what we see is something that we are. Artists become an architect of experiences that allow us to perceive the world in new, and uh, relevant ways by opening the doors to transformation and understanding. So I would like to uh, conclude before giving the floor to Ilaria. And being here today is an incredible honor, but also an important burden. But when it comes to responsibility, well, it comes from the word respond. And as an artist, I feel, as it happens to all of us, the urgency of contributing to stimulate this empathic process and also to uh, uh, trace a pathway so that this happens. And I also believe that in a moment in which we do avoid to be in processes or to avoid processes because we are afraid to know well, that is the moment in which the degree of uh, fear increases or of uncertainty, whereas having this feeling of change and future, well, I love what you are developing. I love what you are doing. Well, this is what I like. That is said to create something new that is not afraid to feel. And uh, also, uh, and it's a, Antonella and I, we worked together over the months to establish this artistic committee and all the participants that have provided an important value to this uh, specific moment. And I hope in the future we can continue this dialogue between art and science to live together and know even more. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Chiara. So from Chiara, we move on to uh, Ilaria Abbiento. And she's from Naples. And uh, she starts with the idea uh, aiming to develop uh, uh, um, an analysis of her inner ocean and she mainly expresses herself through photography, but she works also by using, for instance, some uh, 
uh, images with uh, literary um, texts and poems. And she deals with such specific installations and videos. Her works were exhibited in important museums, both in Italy and abroad, including the Pino Pascale Museums and the Macro Museum of Rome and the Pavilion of More uh, Contemporary Art in Milan and in Paris. And she also participated in uh, several activities. She won a lot of awards. And uh, um, so at this point, you have the floor. Thank you. Grazie di questo preziosissimo invito. Thank you for uh, this invitation. I'm very glad. And thank you for being here. I won't be as good as my predecessors because I'm very emotional and I get moved very easily. But I will do my best to talk to you with an open heart. Samudra Kara Nadi. The river belongs to the ocean and it runs towards it. To it, it goes back constantly and running, it takes any path, any form and any land it crosses, any obstacle it gets through, he always runs towards the ocean. The river therefore is an ocean in its form as an individual form and the nature runs towards the ocean of full awareness of being in every choice we make or breath or decision action we always go back to it constantly and in this flux of what we are there is the meaning of things in the light of the soul with which we inhabit it. This is the only choice available. This is the only freedom we have here now, only ocean. Daniel Lumera he is a biologist, naturalist, and he is a point of reference at an international level of science, meditation, and well being. And he provides this definition of this mantra that became my mantra as well, that I always say every time that I go to the sea, to the seaside. And this mantra is in Sanskrit called Samudrakara Nadi. I wanted to greet you in this way and to introduce my speech in this way because basically myself, me, myself, with uh, all human beings, we should feel in connection, in full connection, not only with nature, but with the whole planet. Often we think that the planet is surrounding us as nature does and the sea does, but actually what i feel what i perceive is we are is that we are guests in this on this planet and we are guests of the nature and we have to respect all of that everything that surrounds us and i'm sure that as long as the human being won't feel this connection a very deep connection with everything that surrounds the human being very few things will change I'm, I, I undertook a very deep personal journey and I thank life for this because for me, this is a miracle personally. And as per my art, this really helped me. I feel deeply connected with nature and especially with sea. I used to say that the sea was my choice since when I was a child, when I start remembering and understanding that I felt good when I was at sea. And now I realize that probably it is the sea that chose me. And I have a really deep connection with the sea. And I'm at, sea, at, in, at the seaside around every day of the year. And I'm very grateful for this. Well, when we talk about deep connections, I just want to tell you that I'm very connected to this uh, artist, Ilaria. I felt all of her feelings when she talks about emotions. When I express myself towards art, I really express a deep feeling, a feeling of love. This is what I feel 
when I'm in touch with this natural element and I try to elaborate it towards my in my artworks and as you will see my artworks talk about me and my existence and everything that happens to me in my life because this helps me to elaborate deeply all my my scars and all the pain that I have within me so I believe that the artist is nothing more than a, um, a means to trans to transfer something and to communicate something. I'm very moved. I'm extremely moved when I talk about this. For me, this is a huge gift that I have received. And I tell you something. I am Ilaria. I am Oceano. I am an ocean. And I do the I do the art, I am an artist, but first of all, I am Ilaria and I became a notion and my work is art to be an artist. Let me start with this project created in 2017. It is called Cartography of the Sea. This is the nautical map of my Gulf, the Gulf of Naples. And I have started this project because I wanted to create a gift to my city and my Gulf. So one day I woke up and I thought, well, with this map, and I often use geographical and nautical maps, I have this passion since when I was a child, atlas always fascinated me well with this map i decided to open it on a table and i decided to travel for one year all around the gulf of naples starting from uh, procida to punta campanella and basically the research the quest that i took the undertook um, and it was not only a journey, uh, a physical journey, was an internal journey. Well, I started to collect my sea, the sea of my Gulf. So I started sectioning this nautical map in 12 uh, parts, and for every fragment representing a portion of the Gulf, well, every portion was subject to a collection, and I decided to create an archive and to preserve what the sea uh, was giving me, uh, the sea in every part of this area. Each one of these areas were significant to you even beforehand, or maybe they started having a meaning throughout the journey. Well, I had memories linked to, to those art areas, but other parts were more a discovery to me. So. It was wonderful for me to discover that the sea uh, that I was exploring in this in those areas, well, was revealing also my inner state, my soul. And you were able to understand this thanks to the cartography of the sea. Well, this project became uh, became a composition of several work of arts. Here you see that the coastal line and the inner movement are crossed together. And of course, compared to the climate and the environment, the weather and the depth of the waters, I changed very often. Uh, I saw that some images seems to follow the same shape of the portion of the map that I selected. And where is the end? In Punta Campanella, the two uh, poles of the Gulf of Naples. Ilaria also uh, remained for several periods in, on islands, for example, in Capraia, and Ilaria, we also have something else, I think. Yes, here you see the final result of this article of the artwork. 
It is a mix of 24 pictures with the uh, nautical map, and I call this um, sea cartography. Uh, as the tide, come la marea, it is an installation of 2018, and with the curator, I was contacted and she selected me among several artists and she gave me this linen cloth. And this cloth is something used to, um, to contain menstruations and every female artist were given this cloth and you could choose how to, to use it for your artwork. Well, immediately I felt the need to bring this piece of cloth with me and I've submerged it in water when I used to go to the sea. And so this cloth was full of sea water and I folded it and on the top of it, I put this container as a message, a message container. And there was one of my seas that I took as a picture because I wanted to create a connection between the moon and the tides. Well, moon has an influence on the sea and on tides. And in the same way, this happens with the, the uh, menstrual cycle. And I tell you more, uh, menstruations was matching exactly with the lunar cycle in the past. Then. In current times, we saw a mismatching of these two phenomena. Aquario, aquarium is very recent, 2021. I start from this image. These are the stones of the sea. And I brought an example here. Those sea stones are simple fragments of glass that were retrieved on the sand, on the beach, became one of the most precious items of my whole existence. I don't want to have jewels, I only want to have the stones of the sea. Well, this reminded me of my childhood, I guess, like many of you. Uh, we, we, we find this on the beach. These fragments originally were pieces of glass, very, uh, very sharp pieces of glass. Maybe there were bottles or glasses, drinking waters, bottles. Um, they, they broke throughout time, but since they were in contact with the sea, they changed their shape. So they were no longer sharp and they lose their, the threat that they carry them. Well, this is the same that happens to me when I work with the sea. I, I smooth out all of my criticalities and I become sweeter. So I created this work of art called Aquario. It is a container and I use the shells or many other objects that belong to my artistic research. This work of art was created during the lockdown, so I could not go to the sea. So I created an archive of all the elements that I had at home in my laboratory or all the collected items that I gather throughout the years. And I have installed this in this, uh, in this, uh, on this table and in this clear case. And this is dedicated to my mom because the womb of our own mother is our first aquarium. And the first ocean is what we find in the womb, womb of our mother. Well, it is quite moving what you are saying. We will start crying very soon. 
So, this artwork dates back to 2020 and it was conceived during lockdown. You have to know that the first days in which uh, Italy declared the lockdown in the country, well, I, I lose my father because he passes away. And so I changed the sentence. Well, it is not that I lose him. He just transforms into something else and he gets to my heart. I'm sorry, I'm quite moved right now. Well, we are all moved for sure. So, as many artists do, I try to collaborate the biggest pain of my life and I create this project called Teorema Celeste and I create a link between two elements, ocean and what is in the sky, stars and the sky, the vote of heaven. And I try to talk with my father in this way, just a glass of water, maybe. Yeah. <laughs> so those two elements on our planet, so the sky, the stars, and the ocean, the sea, were put together in a way to create a link with my father that I feel he is in another dimension. And the most beautiful memory that I have with him is when we used to go on the rooftop of our house in the countryside. We used to lay down on this rooftop in, during summer and we used to see falling stars and we counted them. So this deep connection between the sea and the sky was crucial, was fundamental. Well, consider that here in this in that period, I'm we are still in, in the lockdown. So I did this at home. Everything that I had with me was, for example, made at home, and I tried to create a, a starred sky uh, at home on a dark fabric with salt. And for example, here you see a shell covered with a, ti a tiny layer, a transparent and clear layer, because I felt that way, very fragile. This is my father. Here I imagine that he is a sailor navigating in other dimensions. And he is laid next to a picture of the sea that he took when he was a child. While this map is a sky map that I saw. And here there is the, the, the mot le coeur, which means the heart. This is a celestial stone that is installed also in the case that I showed you before. And this represents a sort of falling star from the sky. Those were experiments that I made at home in order to create a relation with another dimension. Thank you.
Vai tu? Ok. Eh, questo eh, l'opera Teorema Celeste, appunto. The artwork Teorema Celeste has within it um, matter installation and pictures and a video, the video you just saw. This is another attempt for me to be connected deeply with another dimension and between and with the sea and the cosmos everything that you see in that video is the reflection of the sun on this on the ocean and it is also similar to the stars i don't know if someone has perceived also the audio of this video and maybe you want to tell me what did you hear with this sound that you hear in the in the video this is a NASA record that is called the Sound of Universe. This was created thanks to the use of a satellite that getting closer to planets, it is able to record the sound of all the planets. So in some way you have an harmony. And so I put it together and you created a harmony between the sounds of the sea and the sound of the universe. Maybe this is what actually created this harmony and a point of um, connection with what was happening within you. Thank you, Ilaria. Ilaria has another poem to read because I really love Pierluigi Cappello, a poet, and he wrote this. It is very simple as a poem. I would like to have an elementary sky, blue as the seas and the oceans, a very clear sky. This is the planet. The blue that you see is the sea. Thank you, Ilaria. Well, now we try to, we don't want to cry anymore, please, Alberto. Carlo Alberto, help us. So, Carlo Alberto Mattaroli, he is an atelierist and he teaches museum didactics and he is the founder of Tutt'altro, art and visual language. He works since 2003 with schools. He creates workshops and um, he looks for uh, the variety of visual language through an university masters on therapy and music and uh, Carlo Alberto together with the association Ilibela has performed the installation Mersus and you will find this within the project and it is displayed in a very hidden room in this uh, area, in this building. He will tell us about the installation and the phases of elaboration and research. Can you hear me? Yes. Good evening, everybody. Antonella said, that you will be able to, to see this installation. Well, I would say that you will have to see this installation because you are here and you also have time tomorrow, probably. And I will try to be very short. Well, what I would like to say is that from the installation that you see here, what you see is a, a phase of a wider journey that I do with schools. Um, it lasts for about eight months. And then the title is Elements of the Nature. Because there are some schools in Rome which do not even have a garden to play for the students. So what does it mean? Instead of giving up and saying, well, uh, I can't do anything here, we can try to have a dialogue with the space in a different way. So starting from the idea that nature is continuously evolving, it is not static, but it offers us a vision that is constantly changing, I have decided to borrow 
some elements from nature and I wanted to decontextualize them and I brought them back to schools within the schools so that children could have a contact in a different way to some elements such as the soil, the land, the water and the air, fire a little bit less for because you understand it is quite dangerous. Well, because it is important to look for chances to offer to children uh, a way to explore and investigate some materials that are surrounding them, but very often are not observed and explored as they as they should. And I will also say something uh, of what I do with uh, the association Libela. But what I wanted to say about the installation in here is that what is very interesting to me is to create a um, cognitive uh, short circuit. I always address those works to uh, children. And in this phase, their intellectual development, well, is very important here. So they take to learn. Well, the short circuit, what does it mean? Well, the fact of using technology uh, is useful here to get in touch with something more tangible. And for example, with sand. And why I do that? Because when I am able to touch and to activate my senses, I can also discover and can learn. But there is also a digital and artificial projection, and this forces the child to activate cognitive processes that are different. Uh, for example, when the child sees it's his or her own shadow, this aspect is particularly fascinating to me. Children also can have an experience of their action on something tangible with images of the nature, in this case, oceans, so they can feel and live what is the change that, can, can, that they can trigger. So in, in my opinion, it is a metaphor of what happens in real life situations. And as per what uh, my association does with Libella is that we have a great willingness of creating and finding out new research and new methodologies to teach because my association deals with the promotion of an idea of children that are recredited of what they do. It is a very long idea and complex idea, but basically we should give them back their importance and we should give back the importance to the process and not to the product. And children are individuals with not only needs, but also intuitions and intelligence and ingenuity. And the adult should not anticipate or maybe be um, too much influential on their processing and their processes that are developing that will emerge very naturally. So I protect the idea of the workshop area where autonomously children can discover new things. And I really do believe in those aspects. Libela is an association working with uh, children and adults. Um, it promotes an education based on the acknowledgement of yourself, the other, and the enhancement of what makes us different. different. From this encounter, uh, for example, we see a set of initiatives and we will try to continue uh, on this path as a joint research. 
Well, since it's very late and maybe we are tired, I may stop here if it is clear what I've said. Thank you for your attention. Thank you again, INGV. Thank you to Eric and so thank you to Madame Lubue, who really Nadia was incredible. She was the fundamental part of those two worlds. Um, and we thank also Roberto, who is still in the car, we can see. Thank you, thank you. Thank you to the artists present here. Thank you to the audience. And we would have loved to be, uh, thank you for being here because without you, it wouldn't have been possible. Thank you and have a good day and a good evening, everybody.